Uh, this week, we kick things off talking about taxes and how ironic it is that national Republicans in Congress are working hard to try and put money back into Alaskans' pox, pox, uh, pockets, while uh, politicians here in the state of Alaska seem hell-bent on taking that money and more out of your pockets. Brad Keithley joins us. Good morning, sir. Michael, good morning. How are you today? You know, it's not too bad, my friend. Not too bad. We're just pontificating on all the weird things in the world, and uh, and now we're coming to your segment, which, uh, again, I guess is one of those <laughs> weird and ironic things. Um, you know, it is. It is is really shocking to me that here we are in the state that has the highest unemployment, uh, we're in the deepest, I think probably one of the deepest recessions in the U.S., and, uh, and, and we've got a national Congress that's working so hard and fighting these battles to, you know, try and give us more of our own hard-earned tax dollars back and do all this. And yet at the same time, we've got politicians who are just convinced that the only way to save us is to take all of that money away from us and more. Yeah, we're actually the only state in the United States that's in a recession right now. The lower 48 in Hawaii are doing fine. It's just Alaska that's in a recession. For obvious reasons, we're tied to oil, and a lot of the other states aren't, and even those, some of those that are, uh, to some degree, have, have diversified. But we're, we're the only state in a recession. But the, but the, thing, that, the thing that has fascinated me is as we have, as we've rolled through this federal tax debate, first in the House and now in the Senate, and assuming the Senate passes something once we go to conference committee, all of the debate nationally has been about the impact of taxes on middle class, on, on the middle income segments, uh, and whether the middle income segments were being treated fairly or whether the middle income segments were being treated unfairly uh, relative to uh, the upper income the upper income segments. That's been the entire debate. And it's not, right. it's not been just, it's not just been the lower 48 uh, representatives. Don Young um, has gotten in it. And Don Young's been talking about uh, the impact of taxes on the middle income brackets and how the House Republicans have, stri have strived to uh, come up with a tax package that is fair to middle income Alaskans. And, and Young was quoted in a article in Alaska Public Media um, as saying, you know, we, we're trying, we're, we're giving, according to the actuar actuarial reports he was reading, I'm not sure everybody's reading the same one, but according to the ones <laughs> he was reading, we're, we're, we're giving, uh, we're giving middle income, you know, uh, taxpayers a $3,000 break. And, and it's all been focused on the middle income. And then you come to the Alaska state debate, and there's none of that. We're, we're not talking about middle income Neither party is talking about middle-income taxpayers. They're just talking about how much you can take. But the, but the, but the fact is that both parties, both the, both the Senate Republicans who have come forward with their plan and the House Democrats that have come forward with their plan, ta hit in, from a, in, in their fiscal plans, hit the middle-income taxpayers the hardest uh, of all of – uh, of between the upper income and the middle income, they hit the they hit the middle income the hardest. They actually hit the lower income harder than that, but they hit the middle income the hardest between the between the middle and, and upper income. And they give the biggest tax break, the biggest break under the fiscal plan to the upper income. Right. But here, so here you've got the, the the national Republicans, the congressional Republicans talking about how they're bending over backwards to do things for the for middle income taxpayers. You've got the national Democrats talking about how the Republicans aren't doing enough for the middle income taxpayers; they're doing too much for the upper income taxpayers. And then you come to Alaska state issues, and both the Republicans and Democrats, frankly, are screwing the middle income taxpayers, uh, middle income brackets, uh, in in what they're doing here. And it's just it, it's ironic. That, that, you know, at a national level, we've got people focused on this segment of the economy for good reason, because that's sort of the driver of the country, right? The middle middle income brackets are the ones that go to work every day. They're the ones that, you know, push the country forward. They're concerned about the driver of the economy. In Alaska, we're just sort of – both parties are ignoring it and trying to do something else. Right. Well, and again, the irony of this whole situation is – they both have have reached out and and damaged the overall economy in the worst possible way. I mean, they say that they want to obviously the Senate's trying to protect that upper income bracket by avoiding an income tax uh, and and the House wants to hit that upper income bracket by putting in the income tax. But they're both in agreement that that PFD cut is the best thing ever. And yet it hits. The lower upper, the, the you know all the other income brackets, the hardest of all of them. 
I mean, it just, you know, you start yeah, looking no. at talking about pushing people into poverty when you're hitting 30% of the lowest 20% of the income bracket, uh, you know, for 30% of their income. That's huge. It is. And, and you know, they, they justify it by saying, well, the PFD, some people justify it. By saying, well, the PFD really isn't income. It isn't income, right? It's a government program. It's a government handout, um, and and we're just the government is just pulling it back, uh, and not and we're not going to hand it out uh, anymore. Well, I'm sorry, <laughs> but it is income. You you look at you, you look at a middle income family of four. It is income. You look at a lower right. income family. It is income. It, well, it is. Not, it is. It's not your money, Brad. We had Clem Tillian on yesterday, one of the founders of the PFD, and he came in and said, you know, the one thing that we need to remind people is it is their money. It is not the government's money. The government got their three-quarter share. This is the one quarter that was put into that permanent fund corpus itself, and this is the earnings off of that. This is people's money. This is not government's money. Government already got their three-quarter share, and they get the 50% of the earnings of it already. Right. And, 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 you know, what, what essentially the Republicans are arguing, the Democrats are arguing, they argue about PFD cuts, is we need to take that money out of the private sector. We need to take it out of people's hands and move it to government. This is the Alaska Senate Republicans that are talking about that. They're saying – they're essentially saying we need to take money that's otherwise going to, to, to citizens to be spent by citizens for choices to be made by citizens. We need to take that money out of their hands. And put that into government. If that's not a tax, then then most economists who who, <laughs> who say when you take money out of the private sector and put it into government, it's a tax. And most economists are wrong. I mean, that's exactly what it is. It's a tax. And at the same time, we've got the Alaska Senate Republicans and the and the House Democrats doing that, taking money out of the private sector, putting it into government. We've got we've got the national uh, politicians debating about who can do better. For, for middle income uh, Americans by putting money into their pocket. Right. So it's it's just it's it, I mean the 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 national debate. Every time I read a national article and and people are focusing on middle income taxpayers and the impact of, of government policies on middle income taxpayers. Don Young saying I'm trying to put three thousand dollars in the hands of 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 a a, a middle income family it just i mean i'm just sitting there with my mouth open because at the same time that don young and national republicans are trying to do that the alaska senate republicans are trying to take four thousand dollars out of that same family and put it in government's hands and you just well, and, you, you don't <laughs> <laughs> and not even put it in government's hands leave it in the government savings account just to add insult to injury take it out of the public economy uh, take it out of the private economy, not even stuff it into the public economy. Instead, just leave it sitting there for a rainy day when they think they might need it down the road. So it doesn't stimulate the economy in any, in any way. Yep. Yeah. Well, if you're if if, if, if we need to be concerned, I mean, the, the, in this in this one instance, maybe not maybe not any others, but in this one instance, the national the national politicians have it right. We need to be focused on what's going on. With middle-income families, they're the ones that are buy, that buy the houses. They're the ones that, that spend in the local economy. They and the lower-income uh, 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 sectors spend heavily in, in the in the in the in the local economies. They are the ones that that help drive the nation. I mean, the reason we focus on them is not because that's just the bulk. In part, it's because of the bulk of the voters, but also it's because of the bulk of what moves the economy. And 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 the national politicians actually have it right. We ought to be focused on them. You can't find – I don't think I, – I haven't done an exhaustive search, but I don't think you can find one article in the Alaska media about the impact of what we're doing to middle-income Alaskans here. I mean we've got articles about what the impact of the national debate, national tax changes are on middle-income right. Alaskans, but, but I don't think you can find many, many, if any, articles in the local media about what the impact of these fiscal policies, the state fiscal policies that both bodies are pursuing – on middle-income Alaskans, and that is that is exactly the thing that the national press focuses on for good reason. It's exactly the thing that we ought to be focusing on in Alaska for good reason. And we're going backwards with those families. We are well, essentially allowing we're essentially allowing upper-income Alaskans, high upper-income Alaskans, to 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 not to pay 
a significant share of the cost of government, and we're shifting those costs of gov- that cost of government as we go into this, as we go into these fiscal policy changes. We're shifting the fiscal the, the cost of government off to middle income and lower income Alaskans. We're talking with Brad Keithley from Alaskans for a sustainable budget here on the Michael Duke Show, AM 700 KBYR and Oldies 102.1. Brad, I think part of the reason why they've been so good about this is that because the the the, the politicians are really controlling the narrative. Uh, because every time I've kind of asked this question of monks, journalists, and everything else, their basic response is, well, they say that they can't cut any more than what they've done. They've got to find new revenues. It's, they bought into this whole argument that they just they can't they can't cut any more. We've done as much as we can do, and 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 that's it. It's it. This is the bare bones minimum. Well, even if we can't cut any more, even if you accept that, and that's the, that's the mantra the Senate Republicans have essentially come up with as they try to justify these PFD cuts, even if you can't cut any more, that's, that's only the first part of the issue, right? The second part of the issue is, okay, if you can't cut any more, who's going to bear the burden? And, and when, you, when you really dig down into this and start looking at it, you want to be careful about who's going to bear the burden because you can make the economy worse or you can make the economy not – not as bad uh, by depending upon who you assign the burden. The problem is the Senate, Repo- Senate Republicans have not only said we can't cut any further. As a result, we need PFD cuts. We can't cut any further, but we're going to assign the burden of this to the to the middle and lower income Alaskans and and largely allow the, the upper income Alaskans off the hook. Well, good 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 for the upper income Alaskans. But it's the middle income and lower income Alaskans that, that, that do a large part in driving the local economy. I mean, that, right. that's, that was the entire focus of the, of the ICER research on this issue uh, when we did the study a couple of years ago. By far the largest adverse, the largest adverse impact uh, of any of the, of the policy choices you could make uh, in terms of new revenues is to cut the PFD. Why? Because it takes money out of the pockets, uh, disproportionately takes money out of the pockets of the middle income and, and, and lower income Alaskans and, and adversely affects the, the Alaska economy as a result of that. So, so yeah, okay, let's just accept for a moment you can't cut anymore. I don't know why that is, but let's accept for a moment you can't cut anymore. That's question one. Question two is then who bears the burden? And, and I, the local media just hasn't done a good job digging down into that on the choices and the impacts of who bears the burden. And, and, and I guess, you know, you and I have quoted the ISA report until where, I mean, we might as well skywrite it and gold plate it and send it out on engraved invitations. Nobody is, nobody is talking about this. Nobody is talking about, uh, you know, except for you and I, it seems like very few people are talking about the largest adverse impact on the economy. I mean, I've thrown this up to politicians and nobody wants to take nobody wants to take issue with it. Nobody wants to come up and discuss it. And 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 I but I think the people are feeling the ramifications and the effect of this truth. Well, exactly so. And that's exactly why, because we've been through this before at the national level, people know what the impact is of of doing tax reform that, that only benefits the, the upper income seg- seg- sector and not the middle income sector. We've been this, through this before the, at the national level. And so people know the questions to ask. What's the impact on middle income Americans of this tax reform? That's why we're having the debate around this issue between the national Republicans and Democrats. We haven't gotten there in, in Alaska. We're not asking the right question. We, we, a lot of people have gotten stuck on the cut spending further and, and really don't move on to the next to the next question. Uh, government has moved on to the next question. They don't want to they don't want to jeopardize their relationships with their contributors largely and their donors. So they don't want to shake the tree on 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 upper income donors and upper income uh, individuals. And so we're not focusing on that question of what happens to middle income Alaskans under these fiscal policies. They are at the national level. We ought to learn from that and start focusing on it also at the, at the uh, state level. Now retired, he's uh, founder of Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. We join him back on the program. Uh, but Beth has got a question for him about income tax, which we've been discussing here in part uh, this morning. Beth, what's your question for Brad? Hey, Brad, uh, federal income tax is supposed to remove the interest deduction for homeowners, but it doesn't stop until 500000 If you own a $500,000 or more home, the interest deduction won't happen for you anymore. But under that level, 
homeowners can still deduct their interest. And that's my understanding. Is that what you see? God, Beth, you got Hello. me. Uh, <laughs> I've looked. I've looked at the impacts of the various uh, proposals uh, on by income segment uh, that have been that have been published by the Joint Committee on Taxation and others. But I haven't. I haven't delved down into the details enough to either confirm or deny uh, that particular provision. Well, the, all the advertising against it is directed at you're going to lose your mortgage interest deduction. And so, I mean, I'm seeing it on my phone. I'm seeing it on Facebook. I'm seeing it on, I'm seeing it all over the place. And it's like, wait, five hundred thousand? They don't need the interest deduction for the most part. Yeah, it's it's been a. I mean, so what so what you see at the at these in these advertising campaigns is one party or another or one interest group or another going in and picking out a particular provision that either affects that interest group. Or they think is is a great thing that 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 they can get people's attention on a great issue that they can get people's attention on. Um, there are a lot of moving parts in the bill. I mean, there's there's uh, 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 the elimination of deductions for teachers uh, who buy supplies for schools. There, there's a lot of things going on in the bill that, depending upon whose phone you're sitting next to or whose phone or what your interest group is, uh, are showing up on your phone. What, I, what I've tried to focus on again are the are the analyses of the overall effect of all of those provisions uh, by uh, by income group and and that is something that has been the subject of a lot of, de of debate even itself because of how all these moving parts affect I mean another another thing is some of the some of the provisions at the federal level that have, that, that positively affect middle income uh, taxpayers that, that that make uh, that provides some of the benefits of middle income taxpayers that the Republicans are claiming, uh, in fact, expire in five years because they need to expire in order to meet uh, the requirements of of making sure that they don't blow up the debt too much. Um, so there's so you can say if you look at it today that there's a benefit to middle income taxpayers. If you look at it down the road uh, a few years after the provisions expire, there's a net detriment. Middle income taxpayers are going to pay more. So it's there's a lot of moving parts that are going on in there. That's certainly one, but I don't I don't know the specifics about that one to be honest. Well, Brad, you did what I wanted you to do, and you said the big picture is really good for us, but you know don't listen to all these special interest groups. You need to go out and do the research yourself. All right, yeah, well, absolutely thank you, right. Thank you. Appreciate appreciate your call. Thank you so much, uh, Brad. We wanted to talk a little bit today about. Um, you know, where resource development is taking us. Of course, there's a lot of big news going on right now in Congress about, you know, opening of Coastal Shelf or potential opening of Anwar. We've seen our new revenue forecast come back from the state talking about how we're going to have more production. We're going to have, uh, uh, you know, higher rates of return. We're talking about the PFD generating a higher rate of return. And yet uh, we seem to still be having a problem with uh, not controlling our spending because we're going to have growing deficits. We do. I, last week was was great in terms of in terms of good news. If you're in the resource industry in Alaska, uh, very good news. The action by the Senate uh, to or the Senate Committee on uh, on Energy to uh, uh, change the rules on Anwar and open up Anwar for for limited leasing the 1002 area for uh, limited limited leasing. Uh, the RDC, the Resource Development uh, uh, Conf Conference. Uh, in Anchorage was sort of good news after good news in terms of additional exploration plan by Conoco, uh, uh, focus on the new development by uh, formerly Armstrong, now Oil Search, and Repsol on their new field, uh, additional drilling that's going on elsewhere uh, on the slope. There was some good news on the mining front, um, and certainly the good news coming from Washington with respect to with respect to Anwar. Good news on the NPRA front, opening up leases, uh, opening up the leasing in uh, NPRA, putting all those, putting all the uh, approved leases on the table at one time. All sorts of good news. The, the 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 problem is if you just listen to that and and sort of take the traditional tie. Well, good news for the oil industry means good news for the state's fiscal situation. Uh, that doesn't turn out to be true. Uh, the reason that 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 we're that that all of this good news, while it improves the situation, um, we're still going backwards. As you and I talked about on the show 
uh, last week at the end of the uh, of the last special session, this most re recent special session, in what I think is probably the most important single slide that came out of that special session, uh, and maybe all of the special sessions after after the end of the regular session, uh, David Teal, the director of the Legislative Finance Division, uh, put together a presentation that sort of mashed up, brought together the the, the presentation that had been made by the Department of Revenue and the, the the presentation that had been made by the offices of Man uh, office of management and budget about their projections of, of revenue going forward and and their projection of government spending going forward and teal brought that together in one slide um, and that one slide uh, shows that we're still going backwards even when you factor in the increased production uh, that that the Department of Revenue has has recognized now uh, is coming from the North Slope, the the sort of the reversal of the of the steep decline we've been in, and now in fact year on year growth uh, for the last two years of production. Even when you factor that in, uh, that we're still going backwards, uh, the deficit's still growing larger. That slide by Teal shows that when you compare the projections that were given just last spring. Uh, by uh, the Department of Revenue of revenue of revenue going forward and OMB of spending going forward. When you compare the current projections against the projections made just last spring, uh, it shows that the deficit is getting bigger, even with the increase in production, um, even with showing you know steady state production across across a number of years now as opposed to significant declines. The deficit is getting bigger. And it's getting bigger because, frankly, largely because spending is blowing up. The the the, the increased spending, even from the spring projection, uh, over the eight-year period looked at by, uh, by and Teal's analysis, we're spending a billion dollars more, um, uh, nearly a billion dollars more, nine hundred million dollars more, uh, over the eight-year period, over and above what they just projected last spring, <laughs> and that's. That's just – I mean, that's staggering. So so all of the good news that we're getting on the resource front, opening up ANWR, um, the 1002 area, uh, opening up NPRA, the, the exploration activities of Conoco, the, the success of, of Armstrong, now Oil Search and Repsol, uh, in, their, in their activities, the, the increase doing more with less, the increase that we're seeing – uh, or the stability that we're seeing from the existing fields, Prudhoe and Kapari. Even with all of that good news, we're still going backwards on a fiscal front. So I don't want my my concern is that people come out of the come out of the RDC meeting and they they were frankly a little bit giddy uh, in in terms of all of the good news on the resource front that you're out there. It hasn't all been delivered yet. We still have a lot of work to do to get it delivered, but a little giddy about all the good news. But that's that's not translating into good news on the fiscal front because spending keeps building and building and building on us. And and we can't we can't lose sight of that ball as we celebrate the good news on the on the resource front. It's gonna get all that all that good news gets eaten up um, and more because we just keep going farther and farther into deficit. It's not it's uh, so I was, it was great to see the smiles. It was great to see people um, a little bit giddy, as I said, coming out of the RDC meeting, the posts they made, the, the comments they were making. But you can't lose sight of what's going on uh, on the fiscal front when you're doing that. Well, and again, I think it comes back to what we've talked about in the past, which is it just seems to be more of a an issue of spending. I mean, the size and uh, scope of government continues to grow. And, and these growing deficits, to me, are just one more indication that they're not really serious about cutting back on, on where we're at with the size and scope of government. When you've got a corporation that's in this situation, when you've got a corporation that is in the private sector that has that just keeps losing money uh, and, and their projections are to continue to lose more money, you've got, it's the board's responsibility to step back and say, hey, you know, we're just not doing something right here. We have we have got to we got to relook at what our fundamental operations are, and get this better. Um, and and I think I think that's where we've come to in Alaska. I think this coming election cycle, frankly, needs to be about who can do this fundamental restructuring better. Um, we, we've 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 tinkered around the the edges of it. 
the Senate went through this this large effort uh, where they were going to address the cost, the Medicaid costs, and you know get those under control. And really, all they came up with was some tinkering. They managed to find ways to shove more of the costs over to the federal side uh, and 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 take less of the costs over on the state side, sort of. Uh, and that, that was really the result of their major effort. They didn't go in and look at the optional services. Alaska has opted into more optional services than any other state. Uh, they didn't go in and look at the optional services and say, hey, really, can we afford all of these at the state level? Can we look at, at places where we can trim back? K-12 is a mess. They, didn't go, they haven't gone back in and looked at the BSA as, as they've done before. This isn't, this isn't like they've never done this. They, they haven't gone back in and say, hey, can we do this different, fundamentally differently? Can we bring down the cost and either deliver the same or, or hopefully an improved quality, just like the oil companies have done on the, on the North Slope? They've reduced costs, but they've improved quality in terms of, in terms of, the, in, in terms of arresting the, the rate decline, uh, the production decline. So it, we, we, no, we've, had, we've been in this now for four years. We, we, we started into this in 2014, I guess three years, a little bit over three years. We started into this in 2014. We're now in 2017. We've done a lot of tinkering at the edges. But what this is showing, what this chart is showing to me, is that we've got to go in and do fundamental restructuring. Um, and maybe, maybe K-12 gets hit less than, than others, but we've got to do fundamental restructuring. We've got to look at things like – the university system is spending more than $20,000 in state funds per student when its own peers, uh, their own self-identified peers, the Montana State System, the Southern Illinois University System, and the University of Maine System, are spending less than $10,000 per student. We've got to go back in and look at this stuff and, and talk about a fundamental restructuring of our cost side. Because if we don't, all of the good news that we had last week on the resource side is just going to get eaten up. If we right. keep going deeper and deeper into deficit, the pressure on coming back uh, and taxing the resource industry more and more and more to raise revenue from them is still going to be there, and all of the good news is going to evaporate. So we've got to celebrate the good news coming out of the resource side, but we have got to go in to the, to the, to the cost structure uh, of state government and get that under control at a fundamental level. The, tinker, the tinkering is not good enough. We're talking with Brad Keithley here on the Michael Duke Show, AM 700, KBYR, Oldies 102.1. Brad, you mentioned the election season, and I think that's where the only change that we're going to be able to really make here when it comes down to it. What do we need to be doing this election season when we're looking at this? I mean, the questions we need to be asking, what do, what do we need to be doing? Well, we need, to be, we need to be asking several questions. The first question is, What's more? What's the most important thing to you, to you as a as a as a as a potential uh, representative or senator, senator or governor? The answer should be the economy. I mean, going back to Bill Clinton's fundamental is the economy stupid. It needs to be the economy. All right. So, what are the principles of the economy? We need to strengthen the economy. Cutting the PFD has the largest adverse effect on the overall economy. We need to recognize that, and we need to get people who will say, "I understand that. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take that off the table, and we're going to go." A different direction. Then we need to ask them about cost structure of government, because as this chart shows, as, as David Teal's chart shows, we do not have it under control. Even with increased, re even with increased uh, resource production, we do not have the cost side under control. We're going deeper into the hole. And they need to come back and say we need to do a fundamental restructuring of government or uh, fundamental restructuring of government on the cost side. And then you need to ask them for specifics. How are you going to do that? Don't just give me platitudes. Ask them how are they going to do that. And if they get, start giving you reasonable answers, then you may have a candidate that you can dig down into. Yeah. Well, this is what we need to do. And, of course, we're going to keep hitting on it day in and day out as best we can. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. You can find him on Facebook as well under that same, uh, under that same name. Brad, thanks so much for coming in and joining us. We appreciate it.